century. So if you're look, you want to you want to find drama and explain the drama, the drama you want to look at is the first global century. That's the one where things are most dramatic. Uh, okay, uh, so did I say that? I think I said that, didn't I? Yes, I did. Uh, and I said that, I believe, yeah. Mm, I said that, yes. I said all these things. Okay, I'm repeating myself. All right, well, let's move on. Um, okay, so there's, two, there's, two, there's the key question. Did world markets integrate? That, for me, is the key issue when you're exploring uh, globalization issues. Uh, I, I want to see uh, markets, labor, commodity, financial markets. I want to see the evidence of integration. Uh, I may also be interested in just the magnitudes of trade taking place, of course, but I want to see evidence of integration, which might be something quite different, as we'll see. So uh, did trade costs fall a lot during this trade boom? So you got a trade boom from Columbus to 1800 over this period. Um, so did trade costs fall? And if they did, which trade costs fell? I mean, it was transport revolutions taking place or more liberal policy that uh, invited more trade or what uh, was going on? Um, OK. Uh, the, the kinds of language that's used in the conventional histories is that um, uh, the trade boom is caused by the discovery. That's kind of benign uh, description of you know, what this rapacious Dutch are doing you know, down south of you in the Malaccas. Uh, discovery? <laughs> Plunder slash burn, you know, discovery? Um, you should be laughing. I make a remark like that. But maybe it's too close to you. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Now, come on. Um, so declining transportation costs or, or other barriers. Um, uh, now, any argument that says that, you know, that this is what would account for the trade boom, decline in trade costs, barriers to trade, uh, we'll call the market integration hypothesis. So that's the hypothesis that sits there on the table, uh, ready to be tested with evidence, rather than by assertion uh, and by reading your history textbooks. Well, OK, if, market if the market integration hypothesis is correct, then I want to see CPC, Commodity Price Convergence. I want to see the prices at the supplying location uh, converging on prices at the consuming location. I want to see prices on, um, uh, on spices in the Malaccas uh, converging on prices uh, uh, in Amsterdam. So I want to see those, those effects, and that'll be evidence of market integration. Um, and uh, you can make that assertion about any market at any point in time. That's what we're looking for, uh, is evidence of convergence uh, of, of prices. Uh, OK, do you find it? And if we find it, then how much do the trade costs? If you can't find it, if you can't find any evidence of commodity price convergence uh, for any of these important markets, that means that there was no decline in, in trade costs at all. There was not any integration in markets at all. It was being driven by something else. The trade boom was being driven by something else. And uh, if we could uh, show that, it would, uh, uh, it would be pretty interesting. OK, so fact is, you can't find it. You can't find any evidence of price convergence. For example, uh, it is extraordinary how good the data is. Uh, I mean, historians of Southeast Asia who work on the so-called medieval episodes of Southeast Asia, they have an immense uh, uh, amount of demographic and price and wage data from this episode to confront a lot of interesting issues. Um, uh, and that's what it looks like. Bingo. Uh, there is no evidence uh, prior to that arrow of convergence 
That is, what's being measured there is the ratio of uh, the what? It's the price, yeah, the sales price to purchase price. And the sales price uh, is the, the price that's uh, prevailing in, uh, in Amsterdam, in this case, relative to the price uh, being received by um, uh, growers uh, in, in the Malaccas. And, if, and that first series, there's volatility, but there's no trend at all, right? Uh, so that ratio is not changing. Note it's a big number. It's more than three most of the time. So a big markup. Um, and for the second series, I've forgotten which is which. Which is which? Oh, it's the coffee one that's spiking up. Uh, and it just simply means that the, the Dutch state monopoly gets better and better at it uh, and is able to extract more rents uh, by reducing the price paid to the supplier and inflating the price uh, uh, sold at, uh, in Amsterdam and the rest of Europe. Um, so there's no evidence there of convergence until you get uh, to the start of the 19th century and then boom, uh, there's the price convergence, dramatic. So if you're looking for these spices and you say, well, these are spices for crying out loud, 80% of the value of commodities being moved from Southeast Asia to European markets, at least in Dutch ships, 80% of them are these spices. It's a huge share. In fact, it is so expensive uh, to transport anything long distance uh, around the world after, right after 1492 that only extremely high value, uh, low weight uh, products are moved porcelains, silk, and this stuff um, uh, are the only things that are moved. Forget about 80% of what people do in these times, grow grains. They're not moving <laughs> in this trade. Um, uh, and that's important um, uh, in other comments I'm about to make. So there's one piece of example. Um, OK, there we go. Um, there are, uh, the important thing I think to remember is that um, uh, what is holding up those price differentials is the behavior of monopolies and, and the other aspects of, of the trade environment which raise trade costs, piracy and all the rest. Uh, those are the things that, that mattered uh, with Asia and the Americas. Um, Okay, uh, so monopolies do monopolies do well, and that chokes off trade and chokes off globalization. Um, so uh, we could debate whether or not those monopolies uh, uh, were very effective in transferring technology uh, between places. That is, they have this dynamic effect, but in terms of their you know their short run impacts, uh, they did nothing but generate losses because they were restricting trade. Also note that we're talking about non-competing goods, pepper uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, these are uh, coffee, tea, these are commodities that aren't grown in Europe. And as a result, they, they will not displace uh, any uh, firms that produce these things in Europe. So there's no problem, uh, uh, no political economy problem from that end. Uh, so that, so that the trade that's coming in on those spices are not uh, directly uh, uh, eliminating jobs and, and all the rest. Uh, so it doesn't become a political economy issue within Europe uh, in terms of these, these commodities. So those are non-competing commodities. Competing commodities uh, are, you'll see in a moment, uh, uh, but they're less important in this episode than they get in the 19th century. And then it becomes a, a problem for political economy and tariff competition and exchange rate management and all the rest. So what about competing goods? Um, uh, what happened to them uh, compared to the exotics, the spices and all that stuff? Um, well, here we go. Here's one. That's figure two on that handout. There it is. 
And this one is textiles involving the Brits. So it's the British monopoly uh, uh, in India. Um, and uh, there's a, a plot of the price markup between prices in Calcutta and, and the other places from which uh, the so-called company is, uh, is getting these textiles and then the prices prevailing in London markets. A lot of volatility in these prices, no trend. That is, there's no evidence whatsoever of market integration and convergence of prices at all. So it's also true, it appears, for, uh, for competing goods. That is, textiles, of course, are produced in Europe. And a flood of textiles into Europe uh, is going to displace uh, uh, European production uh, of textiles, whereas the spices don't have the same effect. OK, here's some heavy-duty economics. Though uh, <laughs> a little hard to see that. Uh, I should have those lines a little thicker. Uh, but that's supply and demand, folks. Right? We all know about supply and demand. Uh, and uh, this is what I'm going to use to illustrate how you have to unpack and decompose any debate uh, involving what's causing the trade boom and all that stuff, whether it's now or then. And along this axis, uh, starting uh, early in the period, uh, prior to Columbus or whatever, uh, at T-naught, that's the volume of trade uh, involving Europe, and then those numbers increase as uh, following a trade boom over time. And along the, uh, the vertical axis are prices uh, quoted in, high prices quoted in the consuming market and low prices quoted in the, in the exporting and supplying market. Uh, and a gap at, some, at the T-naught, there's this gap between that MM curve and the SS curve. And that's the, trade, uh, that's the trade cost. Think of tariffs, if you want. That's the trade cost. OK. Uh, so uh, we got this MM curve for Europe, which is import demand, but it's, uh, it's net uh, domestic demand uh, versus uh, domestic supply, uh, and, and a price. Uh, so there it is, and shown here with an outward shift in that uh, European demand, uh, which is a possibility that might be a force that's accounting for the trade boom. And I'd like to know what the components are that might be driving it. Uh, and uh, then there's the, the foreign supply uh, of the spices and the textiles and all that stuff, again, net uh, with another price, P star. Uh, and uh, remember, it's net uh, supply. I'll come back to that issue in a moment. So there we go. An outward shift in that is going to also contribute to the trade boom. So there, there are three possibilities that might be accounting for the trade boom. Whatever it is shifting the outward supply in Asia or the Americas, uh, whatever is shifting the import demand in Europe outwards, uh, and whatever might be eroding that trade cost, that T. But we've already concluded that that trade cost doesn't diminish. There's no market integration. There's no price convergence. So the amount of trade, the trade barriers uh, are, cannot account for the trade boom at all. So forget that one. So it's going to be the other two, components of the other two. Uh, OK, so like what? Uh, uh, well, we went through all that, and that won't do it. Um, um, we do not have a fall on the wedge. I just said that. I'm repeating myself. Um, so, okay. So is it supply or is it demand that's driving the story? Um, well, uh, notice uh, what happens when uh, the... Um, uh, when, uh, well, this, this, this is a case where you have an erosion of the, of the trade costs. And you get the trade boom uh, as a result, but we've kind of rejected that as a possibility. 